Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Christophe Fauger. Welcome to Mastering Money. This is session number four, Money and its Symbolism. And this is lecture number 14, Carl Jung and the Archetypes. So what are the learning goals for this particular session? We're going to look into what the unconscious is and how it impacts beliefs, what your beliefs are about money, how to uh, switch to more empowering beliefs, and what is your money archetype. First, let's look at some images and that come from uh, you know, the media and the, our culture, the magazines, um, which are symbolic of um, wealth, abundance, money, some of this terminology also that we read a lot about and that are, is conveyed in uh, our language, everyday language that we hear um, from our relatives, our friends, our business uh, associates, and so on. So first, we're going to um, um, talk about Carl Jung, who was a psychoanalyst and friend of uh, Sigmund Freud. Disagreed with him with respect to some of the explanation of neurosis and uh, was focused more on the uh, spiritual and moral aspect of uh, psychology. Founded his own stream of psychology called analytical psychology. So what is the Jungian pattern? Uh, Jung distinguished between three layers uh, related to the psyche. And the first layer is the outer layer or the more superficial layer, which is consciousness and the ego. And this is the layer that we believe uh, is responsible for most of our decisions. But to some extent, we are a little bit deluded because there are two deeper layers that really affect our behaviors without us really knowing. And this is the personal unconscious. And the deeper layer is what Carl Jung calls the collective unconscious. So as mentioned before, the two components of the unconscious which are really important to, uh, to study are the personal and the collective unconscious. The personal unconscious contains experiences that have been forgotten or repressed and it, and it uh, essentially uh, leads to uh, complexes, which are um, thoughts that are fixated on certain aspects that dominates your life. For example, the money complex, the power complex, the mother complex. These are not things that we're going to uh, spend a lot of time in this presentation. Rather, we are um, going to focus on this next layer, which is um, which we're going to uh, study. And Carl Jung says about it, there is a second psychic system of a collective, universal and impersonal nature which is identical in all individuals. This collective unconscious does not develop individually but is inherited. It consists of pre-existent forms and he calls that the archetypes. So we're going to link these archetypes with the development of our beliefs. So what is a belief? A belief is a group of connected thoughts related to a common theme that keep reappearing in our minds, so much so that this common theme becomes a truth, one truth that we believe and we live by. So where do beliefs come from? They come from the personal and the collective unconscious. They come from our families, our ancestors, our own self-talk, and other people uh, that are surrounding us and who are influ influencing us. Most people are not aware of their own belief systems. Um, they express these belief systems through language, thoughts, and actions, and that's actually a way for other people to learn about, uh, you know, your friends' beliefs, your partner's beliefs, your associates' beliefs, but it's also a way to, for ourselves to learn about our own beliefs is when we express them 
in language and we hear ourselves say things and we realize what our beliefs are. So there's a video that I'm pointing a, a link to here which talks about um, uh, how the subconscious is most of the time in the driver's seat and, and guides our actions, our thoughts and our beliefs. And one term that I'm going to introduce here and we have introduced in the, in the previous lectures is the term mindfulness, which is a way to become self-aware uh, of what uh, drives us and enables us to access our subconscious mind and reveal our hidden beliefs. In that process, it is key to arrive at it with a spirit of acceptance and no judgment about ourselves. This is also key as a process of unveiling what our true beliefs are. <clears throat> So there is an exercise that I'm uh, inviting you to do, which is the internal conversation about money. So you're going to work with a partner on this exercise. You will fit the sheet, my current relationship to money and abundance. You're going to make a list of your beliefs or prejudices regarding money and the overall theme of abundance. <coughs> you're going to identify the origin of these beliefs. Assess what you feel regarding the fact that these beliefs are guiding your life. Share your answers with your trusted partner, who will sim simply listen to you quietly without judgment. So this works to be done with another person, a partner that you trust. This is what the sheet looks like. So you're going to make a statement of your belief, let's say belief number one, you're going to uh, is try to remember when you encountered it, what age, and who taught it to you, and then you're going to rate that belief in terms of how it makes you feel. So there, very uh, important to realize, we're not trying to um, ask you if your belief is strong or weak. We're going to ask you, well, when you are... Um, becoming aware of that belief within yourself, how does that make you feel? Does it make you feel good or not so good? So maybe that belief is a plus one for you. Okay? And so you're going to go on like this and you're going to write, if you can, at least five beliefs. So in the second part, uh, your internal conversation about money, part two, this is what you're going to do. With that same partner, uh, that partner is going to guide you through a different process, which is my new relationship to money and abundance. Your partner will ask you to define a new belief, which will elevate your well-being sensation by at least one notch on that scale that we previously seen. Your partner will check with you that this new belief really is better for you and credible believable to you. That is a very important point. This exercise has to be done in a way that it has to be done in a trusted space, in a space where you can really look within and uh, create those new beliefs in a way that is deep, okay, which has a lasting uh, impact on you. If this new statement is not credible to you, then you choose another one. When you are sure that you can accept that new belief as true, then increase your well and, and increase your well-being by at least one notch. Then you choose another belief and you repeat the process and try to elevate it to a certain point. Okay. When you're done with this, uh, then you switch roles and you go back to part one and part two and you have switched roles. Now you become the one who's listening and the one who's coaching your partner to elevate their beliefs. And this should last about uh, an hour total to do this. So what happens is you have this new relationship to money and then you start from the bottom and you choose one of those beliefs right here that makes you feel more or less good and if it feels good already you try to raise it up so it feels even better okay and then you choose a new one progressively and it has to make you feel higher on the scale so maybe you were at the minus one before 
and now with the new beliefs you are at a plus one and you keep coming up and coming up until you reach maybe that new belief which is at stage number four here and you will have elevated your sense of well-being and crucially you are willing to say hey you know what I like this belief I, I think I can make it part of my life this is a, uh, a picture uh, drawn by Hieronymus Bosch in the uh, 1500s and that is really expressing some of the deeper unconscious things that happen in human beings so let's talk about the collective unconscious the collective unconscious are universal instincts and memories that are buried in the psyche. All these influence transcend time and geography. These are the ancestral memories, which are an invisible force that shape our beliefs. And this is not recent. This comes from our deeper past, you know, 2 million plus years of evolution and 2 million years of cellular memory that's ingrained within us. So what are some of the archetypes? You will recognize some of the archetypes because in modern culture, literature, religion, music, art, you meet them all the time. And those are, for example, the villain, the hero, the wise man, mother nature you're very familiar to with these uh, archetypes and these create images on which you base your perception of the world and they may even create some sort of sense of 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 purpose for you because you may identify with some of these archetypes there are other archetypes like the innocent the average man the healer the maverick the lover the creator and so on So I'm going to invite you to watch this short video um, uh, of uh, Joseph Campbell interviewed by Bill Moyers in the 1980s and uh, where um, Joseph Campbell talks about Star Wars and essentially drawing an analogy between Star Wars and our daily lives and, and, uh, and the myth and the beliefs that are underlying some of our daily lives. A very powerful little video and I invite you to go watch it and I'll put it as a link below this video. Carl Jung talked a little bit about money and uh, the idea of money, we talked about this in uh, the earlier lectures, uh, money is heavily charged with uh, uh, emotional and symbolism content and is associated often with the mother uh, a goddess, uh, in particular Juno Moneta in, uh, in ancient Rome. Um, Carl Jung here just describes in this paragraph um, the way that money has evolved in the 20th century and that it's become something uh, without a lot of uh, um, uh, meaning and a lot of uh, uh, relatedness. Um, so um, he talks about the emptiness of money in terms of being paper money that is issued by the government that is not backed by anything uh, real. And James Hillman, who's also a uh, Jungian uh, analyst, uh, more recently says that money is really a root of many, many issues uh, and problems uh, in our modern societies. And this is a source of focus of angst. And uh, this last uh, phrase, which is a, a nice little paradox, money is devilishly divine. So what are the archetypes linked to money? So we got essentially uh, the archetypes, which again are linked to our cellular memory, are wi deeply ingrained within us. There are eight main archetypes, the ruler, the romantic, the alchemist, the accumulator, the nurturer, connector, the celebrity, and the maverick. So the ruler, he or she uses money as a yardstick to measure success and power. That person is interested in uh, really have a dominating position in society, uh, but of, often the ruler is motivated by the desire to compensate for personal insecurities. We have uh, great billionaires in the history uh, that um, 
that have accumulated tremendous amount of wealth, but through their behavior, um, you know, demonstrate that this accumulation of wealth was really the result of some uh, lack or some um, psychological need to prove to the world that they were uh, worth uh, something. The romantic, he or she devours life and loves spoiling him or herself. Uh, flamboyant spender, uh, but sometimes may accumulate debts. <clears throat> the alchemist is uh, someone who uses their creativity and emotions to actually uh, transform their ideas into financial successes. And wealth and money are byproducts of these ideas. Typically, the person is trying to really create products that will uh, that may change the world, you know, bring new services and increase the, the the welfare of the people around around. The accumulator is um, has a great connection with money and a great respect with money, and is able to accumulate large sums of money, but. Uh, that may also be a reflection of something that is uh, of a need that was repressed and that was not fulfilled. The nurturer has a tendency to give lots of money to relatives or friends that uh, they deem uh, are in a needy position. And that could be unhealthy if it goes overboard and that um, Essentially, the nurturer has to be responsible to give money and not to put themselves in financial danger. The archetype number six, the connector. It's interesting. That person is really uh, intending to create a large network of, of relationships and money is also there, a byproduct of good relationships. So for them, money is not primary, is not necessarily the primary goal. Relationships are the primary goal, but they understand the power of networking and the power of leveraging relationships to, uh, to, to uh, generate money. The celebrity loves to attract people's attention, so they are showcasing luxury items, and this is, uh, this is more of a uh, accumulation of money is more driven towards that goal. And the maverick is someone who thrills, gets these thrills by um, just uh, earning money. And money is a game. And, uh, you know, those are often people found in the finance industry uh, where they love the adrenaline and the dopamine that are secreted when they're making deals. So I want to invite you to uh, take a uh, Kendall Summerhawk's test, which I'm going to put as a link below this video. And uh, what are the three archetypes that you first think from that list are uh, matching your personality? Then take the test and find out from the scoring of the test, which are the, the ones that come on top. Are you surprised by that result? What do you learn from this result? So thank you very much for your attention.